So before we start talking about the um, the aesthetic crown flow, I just wanted to go over this topic right here. Uh, one of you might recognize this uh, beautiful restoration done by uh, one of our EFTAs, beautiful carries ex ex excavation and um, you know ability to stay away from the pulp by one of our stellar docks. Uh, but this is a, a concept that. I don't know, I've stumbled upon over the years. I don't know if it has a name, what have you. But it's the idea of when you have a restoration where 100% of the um, cable surface margin is axial in nature. I'm gonna accept somebody here. So the idea is when you have a restoration like this, more or less 100% of the bond, the chemical bond, is what's responsible for the physical integrity of this restoration attached to the tooth. Now, most restorations we have, we have some support. I mean, I guess we could call this support down here, uh, but that's on dentin root surface, and I'm guessing that was a glass ionomer, uh, maybe an open sandwich technique. But regardless is there of the a photo that you're looking at. Oh, I didn't share my screen. Thank you, Chad. All right, there we go. Is that better? Chad, you see it now? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. Chad, you want to let me know? Can you, can you see the screen now? Yes. All right. Sounds good. All right. So this was the restoration done by one of our EFTAs. Again, very close to the pulp. I'd imagine um, some Theracal was used. Uh, but the point is, when a restoration is like this, it's under what we call tensile stress. Meaning, when we chew on it, we are relying on a chemical bond right here and maybe a little bit of support right here. Whereas most restorations, we have a lot more support probably from some occlusal aspect of the restoration. Uh, I've had a lot of these fall out over the years, even with what I would consider good bonding techniques uh, because of the fact that it's under that 100% tensile stress. So one idea, uh, and again, it doesn't necessarily need, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it every time, but it's just something to think about. It's very possible that there was enough enamel here that the chemical bond between the resin composite and the enamel is sufficient enough for this restoration to last however long this restoration needs to last. Uh, but another idea is to use the concept that came out of amalgam, extension for prevention. Maybe we can call this extension for prevention of dislodgement. Uh, by maybe removing these amalgams, not because the amalgams need to be removed. We all know that these small occlusal amalgams on molars tend to last forever. Uh, but gaining access to the enamel in these areas might give us a conversion of tensile stress to compressive stress. So it's just a, this was a really good image to have that discussion about what it means to convert a restoration from one stress environment to another. Is this new? Um, is this obvious? You know, I'd love to hear what people think. I would do that for two reasons. Um, I, I do that frequently, um, but I also, the mesial of that tooth looks a little, like it could be one of those things that's nothing or it could be something. So I often will drill through the occlusal to almost see if you can see a shadow through the marginal ridge at all, like from, that makes sense to you. Sure. So by removing that amalgam, you kind of almost get to double check yourself at the same time too. So I probably would do it for both those reasons. Sure. Yeah. Let, let's just say for the sake of it, that that mesial was not potentially there. Would you still remove the amalgam or 
maybe just create an enamel bevel to try to get some occlusal composite or or not even prepare the tooth in any way but etch the enamel and then bring some of your composite kind of in this area so that when the patient's functioning this restoration is receiving some compressive force yes i would because i i have had the same problem before where i was not doing that i feel like they would fail after a while from strength um yep. a strength issue and as soon as i started doing that i had far less issues yeah yeah, well, I'm glad you had that same realization. I, you know, I never want to do something just because I think it's right. But um, this made sense to me that over the years I started to get more aggressive with these kinds of restorations because they're common, you know, especially the lower d distal molar. Would this be the same concept as doing like a slot prep versus a full uh, like DO? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the, so I, I was never really taught the slot prep. I mean, I, I know what it is. Um, I can't help but want to use David Clark's concepts. I don't know if you guys have ever taken any of his courses. Uh, David Clark is a guy that came up with BioClear. And he has a class two restoration concept where it's almost like a saucer shape. He calls it a cow lily shape. Uh, essentially, it's a class two composite prep, even when it's small that's very aggressive to take advantage of maximum enamel. So it, it takes advantage of his infinite edge or infinite uh, beveled margin concept. Uh, so the idea of a slot prep to me, I think it's damn hard to restore those small restorations uh, with any predictability. And yeah, I, I do think this is somewhat analogous to it because you have very little enamel in those slot preps. With that said, I have zero experience in them. Does anybody here have any experience with the slot preps, good or bad? If it's a tiny filling, I'll do those pretty frequently. But sure. Again, yeah, if it's if I don't have a good gingival seat yep. or enough enamel to bond to, that's when I bring it up over on the occlusal a little bit. But it's mostly pretty molars. Sure. So you, you, I mean, the concept of bringing it onto the occlusal, I guess that's that's really where it's at. So it's good to hear that other people have come to this conclusion. Um, for me, it was the hard way of restorations like this where, you know, the restoration's great. It's just maybe this restoration in the wrong mouth uh, might not biomechanically uh, hold up. Um, with that said, great restoration, great caries removal. Um, it was just a really good x-ray that uh, the assistant had sent me and I, I thought this would be a great great topic for us to think about uh, anything else with this photo here all right on to the main event so the whole idea here is to get a little better or hopefully share some insight on how to get better with anterior single unit crowns so let's start with this. Anybody want to take a, a stab at which which of the six anterior teeth is a crown? Number eight. Yeah. I would love to get back in this patient's mouth and then buff out the other teeth because it's a little obvious that uh, they're kind of dinged up. But yeah, number eight. So the goal the goal is to be able to get to this level where you can create a tooth that looks. Um, as natural as this does. So what are, what are some things about this photo? So photography is the, the tool or the, um, the method at which we need to communicate with our labs. Uh, like we talked about last week, we could maybe send our patients to the lab. I have not had great success with that because I'm relying on the discernment of the lab technician to actually see things. So I like to create almost a dummy proof paint by number process so that the lab technician simply just follows my directions and I remove any sort of um, misinterpretation or lack of focus on really what is needed to, to create an anterior crown. So there's a few things with this photo I wanted to, to highlight. Anybody wanna share? So the crown, the crown being done is number eight. Shade tab there should be in the same line and plane as the other truth if you're trying to shade match. Correct. And how, how do you do that? 
flip it around and put it inside the lens, inside the lens, tab to the truth. Exactly. So light reflection with our cameras is really important. So if if the shade tab is not uh, facing the camera with the same plane as the tooth of object, then we're going to have different light reflections, which is going to give an error in the observation of the different shades and translucencies. So thank you, Luke. What else do we see? The angle, I mean, you learn some detail on the texture of tooth number eight, but it should be a straight on, not just the tab, but the patient should be centered. Yeah. Absolutely. I can read the shade tab that's there, that's on the frame. Yep. Yeah, one of, one of the first really good photography, photography courses I took made the comment that your occlusal plane should be perpendicular to the image meaning you really shouldn't see the occlusals of the posterior teeth in the image. Um, but like Mark said, it's just making sure you're coming straight on, both with the shade tab and the natural tooth. Even if we did, like Luke said, and, and inverted this shade tab, incisal edge to incisal edge, from this angle, we're going to get different light reflections. So we want to make sure we come, uh, the camera should be, the camera lens should be parallel to the front of the tooth, which in this case it's not. So good one, Mark. What else we got? The other thing I would also do is, um, let's say you're doing a video class that can picking A3. I'd still have the whole card that has A1 through 4 and yep. line that up. And I just center it on the shade that I think it is. Love it. Yeah. Contrast, which is what you're providing the lab technician, or if it's you doing you know, most of the shade matching, having that contrast from shade to shade is super important. There's so many times... I've done that. I was dead set on one shade, but there was information in, in another tab that gave me some sort of idea on how to get there. So adding additional shade tabs is definitely important. What else do we see? You're covering number nine, which is not helpful for aesthetics. <laughs> that was what, I mean, to me, I, it happens all the time, mostly with the assistants, because they, they, you know, they're doing number eight, so shade match number eight. Um, you always shade match the tooth you want it to look like, not the tooth you're prepping. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Elena. It sounds obvious, but it, it happens all the time. Here, it's a little obvious because number eight is so, so bad. We do it all the time. I, I still do it. I shade match the tooth I'm prepping. So, this photo is something I had squared away for a rainy day, and here we are. What about the lip? There's several things with the lip that's going on there. Poor retraction. Yep. So we can't see the incisal edge of number nine. Obviously, the lab technician needs to know how much kind of gray, brown, orange, you know, whatever color tends to be up there. It's super important to include part of that. There's oftentimes you want to know the gingival architecture. Is it a thin biotype, thick biotype? That might influence how you treat it. Um, there's another thing which is important, and it's the fact that we rely on light getting to the object tooth. And when the lip is in the way, the lip will often intercept a lot of the light making its way to the tooth, and you might not get the white balance that you're ne that, that's needed. And for those of you who don't know what white balance is, uh, when you take a photo, you want to make sure that you have all of the natural wavelengths of light hitting the tooth um, and the amount of energy that you put on the tooth kind of influences how much of that and we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit uh, but what's important is you're getting light to the cervical area of the tooth and then the assistant's finger um, I don't know how important this is but I had once heard from somebody who's really big in aesthetics say <clears throat> uh, one it just looks sloppy it's lazy good retractors implies that the dentist knows what they're doing a photo with an assistant's finger and it implies that they don't know how to do good photography uh, take that for what you want but there was a comment about it's hard to shade match when you have something so different like a purple glove or a green glove uh, i don't think it does anything to the photo but it does something to our eyes when we're looking at the photos so if in, under ideal conditions you have a perfect image with 
no retractors, no fingers, perfectly parallel, um, and an un, not an uncropped, but a photo that doesn't need to be cropped. So I got in the lazy habit for a while when I was learning how to use my camera, I would just take an image and be like, oh, I'll just crop it later. Um, well, one, that never happened because we're busy and that just doesn't happen. But two, when you use the camera like you're supposed to and you get the frame exactly the way it should, for some reason, the photography just gets better. And there's, there's all kinds of reasons for that far above my knowledge of photography. But create the frame in the camera that you want that has only the information you want, ideally. So I think for most interior cases, something 5 to 12 6 to 11 somewhere in there would be important and then the last bit it's obvious but it happens to the best of us um, the shade tab is cut off i think we can probably deduce that's either that's probably c3 uh, but just always making sure that when we take the image we have the shade tab um, indicated so that we don't have to guess what shade it is uh, i will also say this one's blurry it's out of focus not bad but the camera that we use um, it's pretty clear that the camera grabbed the focal point of the finger and not the teeth that's something that you can control with these cameras all right lab slips i think we all know the most common lab slip shade people write a2 number 18 number 19 sure uh, i try never to write just one shade even in the posterior um, this is this is from Drake Dental Lab, I believe, years ago. I had taken a course from them, and they had kind of commented on what dentists write for shades. Uh, the most common lab slip for the aesthetic shade is A3, A2, A1, some sort of transition, but really no description on how to make it look like a tooth. It's obvious, but I just wanted to put it here. Um, we can do better than this, I, I, and I bet most of us, if not all of us, do. Um, I don't like using the lab slip as my map. So this is an example of what I do for most anterior crowns. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys do some version of this. If there's anything I can propose, just do it on a separate piece of paper where you're not limited by the small amount of real estate that you have on a lab slip. I then send it with the, with the lab slip. Uh, the specific specifics of this, as some of you might know, the um, the shade tab. This is the Vita class, or sorry, the 3D Master Shade Guide, 2M3, OM3, so on and so forth. We'll go into why I think that's a superior um, shade guide, but both of them have their place. But this degree of setting the lab technician up for success is really what it's all about. You're literally telling them what to do with the paintbrush. You're removing their potential inability to look at a tooth and say, hmm, I see a little bit of translucency there. Oh, an enamel rim. If they have an untrained eye, they're not going to see an enamel rim. And unless you put it on there, you're not going to get it. And if number nine has it and your crown comes back and it doesn't have it, it might not be the end of the day, but it's not going to be what gets you um, perfection. People have any thoughts about this? Anybody doing anything like this? Is it overkill? Are you, are you, how, how much of this are you thinking, thinking about chair side, side versus, versus just looking at the photo afterward? afterward? I look at all the photos after and you'll, you'll see why. So I don't do this chair side at all. Reason being, you can see a lot more in the photos, but you have to know how to use the camera in order to get the right images. And I'm not using one image, I'm using 12 to 20 images. Uh, to get a really good sense of what the tooth actually is. Could you do it chair side? Yes, but that's wasting chair time. I, I tend to do, do this after hours. I'll often use colored pencils to draw some contrast, uh, but I think we all get the idea of, you know, just add character so that when the lab technician gets it, they are simply copying what you did. You're actually doing the work. And I, I think if we go back to that image in the beginning, I don't know. I. I've never had a lab technician, even with good photography, do a great job. Until I started doing this, this was the, the ticket to uh, superior success with aesthetics. 
Uh, with that said, it's still freaking hard to do. Um, I'm not sure I could do any better if I had, if I knew how to do ceramics. I mean, it, it's hard. And there's all kinds of ways. We're going to talk about a few different ways we can tilt the scales in our favor so that what we get back matches. Anybody ever seen this before? So it's a color sphere. And this little area right here is the section cross-sectional three-dimensional representation of where natural tooth colors exist in the color sphere. It might seem like it's unrelated to everything, but I'll show you why it's important. Here is that three-dimensional color sphere dissected into a two-dimensional representation. As you can see, the underlying part of the graph shows that we're actually in three dimensions here. This is the um, Vita Classic shade guide representation within that natural sphere. So again, this is natural tooth colors. Somebody studied the colors and how they show up in the grand scheme of things. And the Vita Classic shade guide, we even have a shade that doesn't even exist in normal dentitions. Obviously smokers and coffee drinkers, they might show up outside that natural realm. Anybody know why this is important? Hey babe, can you grab me a water? All right, so go ahead. You can't just tell the lab to blend halfway between like a B2, B3. Yes. So we, I think we all knew that, that you can't do that. And I, I didn't know why until I saw this representation and Mark hit the nail on the head. Um, the Vita Classic Shade Guide, the shades were based on... I don't know how the story goes. Back in the 1920s, some dentist took a bunch of extracted teeth, put them into categories, and came up with shades. <laughs> like, you know, that's, and then it's just stuck. But back then, the aesthetic demands weren't very high, the materials weren't very powerful. So it wasn't super important to actually understand what colors should be on a shade guide. And also, like Mark said, when you say A2.5, that means nothing because the distance between, I don't know, Let's say that's that's probably B1. Let's say that's A2 and say that's A3. The distance between the two is not, it's not linear. So by giving decimal points, you're not saying anything. We all know that colors are hue, chroma, and value. Those are three movable data points. Saying 0.5 doesn't mean anything. Now, there are labs that have shade guides that have decimal points that they've they've created so customized shade guides are fine so when you say a 2.5 if your lab technician knows exactly what you're saying and you guys are on the same page then you can do that uh, but that requires obviously being on the same page so vita came out with the 3d master shade guide to hopefully circumvent the problems associated with the with the vita classic shade guide this is what they came up with what they did is they, they ditched all the classical shades and they said, if we intersected this sphere, where would we want to intersect it? And would it make sense to clump them together and then allow the, the, the dentist to actually do intervals between those? And we'll go over what, what all this means in a second. But like Mark was saying, you can't use, use decimals or fractions for the Vita Classic shade guide. You can with the 3D Master. You could say 2M 2.5 and the lab technician knows exactly what you are because that 2.5 is a number that indicates the chroma. The value is the first number, so on and so forth. So there's ways of using those fractional um, aspects to shade matching that's important. So if we look, look at the two together, I think it just makes sense. Now, does it mean we can't use the one on the right, the classic shade guide? No, I mean, that's still a very good shade guide because a lot of teeth actually do land in those aggregated areas of the Vita Classical Shade Guide. As you can see, um, the bleach shades are, are not really captured where the 3D Master has the OM1, OM2, OM3 shades. Uh, and then you can see it does a better job with the darker shades down here. So there's lots of reasons why the 3D Master Shade Guide is better. With that said, sorry about the loons in the background. Uh, with that said, there are times when a Vita Classic shade tab is a better one than anything you can find here. 
So I like having both of them. I often take photos with both of them in there. But I think the understanding of the limitations of the Vita Classic Shade Guide is really what I wanted to get across here. Thoughts, questions? Was this taught in dental school? I, I wasn't taught this until I took a course. Do you, do you like start with the classic shade guide? And if it's just not looking how you want, or you can't find something that matches like you want, then you move to the, uh, the other one? Or do you just kind of look at it like, yeah, this seems like a, a master shade type tooth? Um, jokingly, I'll do what, what answer gives you a good idea of how good a dentist is. If their answer is, I don't know, whatever my assistant gives me, um, that's what I use. Uh, no, for, for interiors, I, I have both out and I take photos of, of both of them. I, I want as many photos as I can. And we're, we're going to look at uh, a recent case that I did that I think came out well and how many photos I took and how I ended up doing it. And again, this isn't a, I'm not an aesthetic master by any stretch. I just, I have fudged my way through lots of different ways of doing it. I just want to share those techniques with you. Uh, in hopes that maybe one or two of these things can upgrade how you do it. Uh, there's the 3D Master Shade Guide. Um, who hasn't? Just say, well, uh, let me go over. I just want to make sure I don't go over this if everybody uses it. So raise your hand if you've never used it. All right, so it's worth us going over how to, how to use this. So again, we looked at the cross-sectional areas of the shades within the sphere, and we saw that they were pretty evenly distributed. Can anybody share with me, when we do shade matching, what is the most important characteristic? Chroma, value, or shade, or uh, hue? Value. Value. Uh, which brings me to... a. A thought and maybe some of us have done this in the past um, if you increase if you set up your Vita classical shade guide in increasing value so it would go like b1 a1 b2 I forget the exact sequence uh, but it's not based on the, the numbers and the letters it's just based on their value uh, that's actually a really good way to use the classical shade guide but we'll, we'll get to that at the end but the reason I bring that up here is because that's how the 3d master shade guide is set up you can see these clumps. So one, two, three, four, and five indicate values, which are the most important within that sphere. We want to look at value first. So what we do is we look at the shade guide. So we kind of put this whole shade guide over the patient's teeth and we choose the category. So we're not trying to match an exact uh, tab. We're just trying to get which group looks the best against the object tooth. What we're doing is we're using value. And there's a really cool hack that if you ever have a hard time with it, you take some photos and convert them to black and white. Value pops. Because that's all. The chroma is somewhat re represented in a black and white, but the hue is gone. Your value is all you're really left with because a black and white photo is a grayscale. And grayscale is essentially value. So if you ever have a hard time getting the value, just know that you could easily take a photo, put it into, I don't know, paint, convert to gray. I mean, there's all kinds of programs you can do. Uh, I've definitely done that chair side because I had a hard time picking up the value. Uh, but you can see here that these are in increasing value left to right. One, two, three, four, and five. And although it's important, it's irrelevant to this conversation, there's a bleach shade, which is zero. It's an add-on to this uh, shade guide. So once you find the relative value of the tooth that you want, then you're in a category. You then ignore all of the other numbers. So if you pick two, you're then looking at these shade tabs. The next thing you're gonna do is the chroma. And chroma is, in my head, best explained by saturation. And I think of chroma as dropping food dye into water each drop you drop in, the chroma increases. And I know this is obvious, but if it's not obvious, it's worth, worth sharing. Chroma is an increase in saturation. Well, the, the two column, the middle 
row, well, actually all three here have similar chromas. As we go down, the chroma increases. And it's tough to see in this photo. Maybe if I use this shade tab here, you can see it a little bit better. But as you progress down, your chroma increases. And I'll go over why there's, five, why there's more here than over here. Uh, before I continue, does that make sense so far? So again, increasing value left to right gives you your number. Then you progress down, which gives you your chroma. And then you go left and right. Right is more red. So it's increasing the red hue characteristic of the shade. And when you go to the left, it's more yellow. So I remember R for red and yellow has an L in it is how I remember it. Um, oftentimes the answer is in the middle I, I, and I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because my eye doesn't pick these up as well. Uh, but the reality is that this is a very clean way to dissect out the three very important characteristics of the um, of shading. Any thoughts, questions? Anybody want a dog? He's free. I'll pay you. I've also heard to refer to it as lemony, lemony yellow, yellow, yellow and rosy red. red. Ah, like it. Thank you, Mark. Lemony yellow. So this side over here, it's a good acronym or a good mental trick to remember how this works. And then rosy red on the on the right. This is, I always forget, forget what that was for. Yeah. <laughs> I, for the longest time, I was like, well, it's not, it, I know red and R match up, so by process of elimination, I go the other way. And then M, I just, it's for middle. Uh, I'm not sure if that's where, where they come from. But what's nice about it is you can do the following. Let's say you choose this column here and this column here, and it's somewhere in the middle. You can say 1.5 or 1.7 or 1.8. The lab technician, at least labs that know how to use this, know exactly what you're talking about. But that 1.7 isn't all three characteristics. It's only value when you say 1.7 because that number at the top indicates value only. So when you say that to the lab, they know exactly what you mean. Likewise, this is 2M1, 2M2, 2M3. You could say 2M1.5, 2M2.2, all the way down. At that point, you're being very specific about how much chroma you want. I don't know if you've ever had anxiety when you write mild to moderate anything on a lab slip and you're like, what the hell does that even mean? Uh, I still write it. If you guys looked at my lab slip that I had before, I mean, I still write that. You know, I'm trying to articulate something very precise to the lab technician with very ambiguous terms. This shade tab removes all of that. Does that make sense that we're able to use decimals? Everybody on the same page there? If it doesn't make sense, speak up. Um, it's important that I think we understand this stuff. The last step is the hue, whether you go left or right or stay in the center. So 2M3, 2.5M3.2, so on and so forth. Now, a lot of lab technicians have what's called a conversion chart. If you send in the 3D Master Shade Guide, if they don't have the porcelains that match up to this, all they're doing is converting it to the Vita Classic Shade Guide. That's not the same thing. So when you call a lab technician and you say, can you guys use the 3D Master Shades? If they say yes, say, are you using a conversion chart and are your porcelains from the classic, I don't know. They might still be able to get you there. That requires a whole lot of mental jujitsu in order to actually get you to where you need to be because they're going into a very um, ambiguous arena. They, A2 doesn't have chroma, v, uh, chroma value and shade separated. So how do you go from, a, it's almost like going from digital, log, uh, digital to analog. I, I just don't know how that would work. Uh, so if you want to really master the shade guide, I would highly encourage you work with a lab that knows how to do it. Uh, Arrowhead Dental Lab is great. They know how to use this. They have the porcelains. Uh, beyond that, I don't know of anybody who does it. 
I was very happy when I found that lab in great part because they did that and I've stuck with them for my interior aesthetics ever since. Mark, you, you've used this. Any other thoughts about this shade guide? Uh, do you use both? Um, I'd, I'd say, say if, if, if I'm, I'm doing, doing a posterior, posterior tooth, tooth and you can, can eyeball it and it looks straightforward, it's also duty classic. Yep. If it starts getting complicated, then I'll pull out this just because you have much less remakes, um, statistically. If I'm anywhere in the front or it looks to be more involved, aesthetics, I'm using this. Um, do you guys like the, the gray cube or do you like this card? Um, I've seen that. I haven't actually used it yet. Um, that's, that's what, what they, they taught us in our dental school is use the, the first card has a 0M1, 1M2, 2M2, 3M2, 4M2, 5M2. So you just do the ones closest and then, oh, my 3 was the one that the best, I grabbed the 3 card and then it's lined up from... Yeah, yeah, what, I do, what I do is I take out all of the L's and the R's, uh, which is kind of doing the same thing. So what Mark is saying... It's kind of busy like it's hard to get the value when you're looking at this these many data points so the cards have just the what is it 1m1 2m 2m1 3m1 is that what yeah, you're M1, the m2s of everything the m2s of everything so it, you're just looking at values comparatively and then once you choose your category then you bring out this shade guide and then start your process down is that correct yep yep, yep. yeah I, I think there's a lot of value there i think the reason why they did that is the way i was taught was to just remove them but that's work and then you got to put them back and they got to go back in the right spots. Um, the downside is the assistance <laughs> break it very often. So what is it? Is it a, like a laminated yeah, card? Yeah. I'll, I'll shut my camera. camera. I'll go fine. fine. I have, I have an actual one in the basement, basement but um, you, you have, have like these cards that just have all the one shades, all the two shades, shades all the three, three shades, shades and one all face down. down. You have another, another card that has just one, one from each. each. So yeah, yeah, 3D, 3D Master. master. Um, Shade uh, card? Uh, that, the, the one, one in the box. box. Dr. Roy, Roy, you didn't even catch, catch your pun. pun. <laughs> no, I did not. What did I say? You said, said there's, there's a lot of value, value there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so that third one, one in, the one, one that's the right uh, so the guy in 3D Master. master. Yep. But it's set up like that. But the downside is when you're done, you have to slip all the cards in and gotcha. you usually rock it and just jam, jam it shut and then it breaks the cards. It's right. not helpful. Yeah, so this is what I do over here, which I can't say is better or worse, but it's worked over the years. So I'm just removing all of the additional information except for value right here. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is if I have one that comes back in the wrong shade. shade. Yep. I make, I make sure, sure to pull up the same shade tabs that I use in my photos and hold it up to the background in the mouth. Yep. Give the lab a little more info of, Love it. Yeah, yeah, this is not quite what, what I asked for. Yep. Love it. This right here looks like the Vita Classic arranged in increasing value. So uh, we're actually doing this in the office. Greenbaum had taken an aesthetics course recently. I'm not sure if it was photography or what have you, but... Uh, he had brought this to my attention and we used to do it just kind of fell by the wayside What we do is we take a laminator on the back side of it and we put the shades in order so that the assistants always know on the back uh, What the order is in increasing value because it's it's rather Scattered it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it unless you memorized it um, Rather than having the A's the B's the C's and the D's Do you, you have, have a set of frequency for switching, switching them? them? Or is it more like our officer wants the tab to go missing and get it inside? Uh, boy. <laughs> We've done all kinds of things over the years. We, um, I don't know if this answer, no, this does not answer your question, but let me just say it. We've ordered knockoffs of Vita shade guides because they're kind of expensive. I don't know, they're a couple hundred bucks a piece. You know, and like you said, if an assistant loses one, it's kind of expensive to replace it every time. Uh, so we had ordered some off net 32 thinking that like we don't order much off net 32 but something like this we thought maybe it would be pretty standard not even close then i ordered i've ordered several non-vita shade guides that are trying to mimic what the vita does what's important here is this shade guide matches to a very specific porcelain so it, 
A2 across different porcelains might be different. So if you look at different shade guides, they often are very different. If you look at a composite A2, it's different. It's different material, it has different reflective properties, so on and so forth. Uh, so to answer your question, Mark, when, when we lose one, um, I mean, by now we just have so many that we often have the missing one from a spare set. Uh, but yeah, you kind of want to have everything, especially if it's in the common, the common zone. But to be honest, I use the 3D Master most of the time, so I don't get hung up when I don't have an A, you know, an A2 or an A1 or a B1. Um, so I didn't answer your question, but hopefully it provided some insight. All right, this is the Vita Classic um, arranged in order. I actually think this is something different, but the point is you can have them increasing in value with the Classic Shade Guide. All right, so this is a patient uh, we did anterior bridge. I think we talked about this one a little while back with the Ovate Pontic. Um, I got his case back and and delivered it unfortunately it didn't fit but the shade was really good so it's going back to the lab this was the, the temporary uh i think this was biotemp so i think glidewell did a pretty good job with our kind of a3 a2 a1 transition based on what the patient had again the reason why we had a long-term temporary here is because we wanted to develop the ovate pontic site to have ideal soft tissue architecture so this is the attempt at delivery. Obviously it doesn't fit. Uh, before we look at the shade, we have a nice receptacle site here. We had talked about the value of an ovate pontic. Uh, several of you within the practice have started doing a lot more of this. Um, Chad, you did something last Friday. I mean, just amazing stuff. When you, when you create the temporary that tells the socket where to heal, you get this. And the reason why this is important, it's much more aesthetic because it emerges from the tissue. You're not likely to get that gap when you get reset if you get recession. Why do you not get recession of this site here? The simple function of this bridge puts a little bit of pressure on the pontic onto the tissue and it stimulates the tissue enough to stay there. So it doesn't take much for this to maintain its space. But if you don't have an ovate pontic, you're not gonna have stimulation as well you're not going to have these nice papilla between the teeth, which means the patient's going to have a food trap. Now we can tell them how, how to clean it. I think we all know the end of that story. The reality is uh, this is a much more hygienic solution for our patients with bridges than in any other Pontic design. This was made possible because of this. Now it doesn't have to be a lab fabricated because of the situation. We wanted to make sure that this didn't break just the kind of patient you don't want to piss off. Um, really nice, smooth, ovate pontic bullet shape created this year. Uh, but as we can see, the shade um, really kind of fits the bill. This is what I would consider a highly complex shade match. I don't know how people do this. I mean, short of sending this to the prosthodontist, if you're not taking good photography or drawing it out yourself, how do you get all this white, you know, these... There's so much character in this tooth. I wouldn't know how to relay that to the lab without doing something as detailed as a paint by number mat. How, how do people handle this? A, a tooth of this kind. I said, I said the, the way, way you taught, taught me. me. Do you want me to pay you in Bitcoin tomorrow or Ethereum? Yeah, I prefer, I prefer Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Oh, oh, well, depending, depending on what, what it's at right now. now. <clears throat> no, but no, I, I think, think I always have great success with really, really explicitly shade mapping. mapping and, and I, mean, I mean, charting, charting out all the little intricacies of the opposing. opposing. Usually it's, it's, you know, number eight. eight. And we're we're going to chart out number nine really, really carefully. carefully. We're going to take our photos with the shade tab against the tooth on the inside of the ledge. So, so that, that it's really, really clear, clear what we're, we're talking, talking about, about and then just, just get, get specific. specific yeah we should get you a uh a shirt t-shirt get specific 
<laughs> oh, oh man, man. Some, some people, people get, get a kick, kick out, out of that out. one. <laughs> Jay Bushman. Jay Bushman. <laughs> All right, so let's switch over to that specific case. So here are the photos that I took for that situation. Um, right here. So again, there's no exact number of photos, but let's walk through. Um, I sometimes don't have the shade tab number in it because I want to zoom in. I feel like it, I'm zoomed out too far. So what I do is I have the assistant write down the shade tab and I correspond it. So she has like a little, a legend, the photo um, file name matches up with the shade tab. And then I go back after, or she, she will often rename them. I, I find it's hard to get really good detailed information for a tooth of this high degree of characterization when I'm trying to capture the shade tab. I mean, that's ideal, but it's also kind of lazy. Um, let's just write it down. I only do that for cases of this complexity. So again, I, I take a whole variety of different photos Now we talked a little bit about white balance. White balance is essentially the concentration of light. This might be a little overexposed. So for those of us who have DLR cameras, uh, the Nikon, if you hit up on the arrow, you'll actually get a histogram that shows you how much light there is. And the ideal light to expose a natural tooth is a little left of center. Um, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, just know that there's a way to determine how much light you need for your photography in the operatory. We can't preset that. Why can we not preset a camera with the white balance? This is super important. What other light sources do we have? For most dental offices, we have color corrected light bulbs. A conventional light bulb doesn't have every wavelength of light. There's really no reason for a conventional light bulb to have every wavelength of light. But if your patient is gonna go into the natural sunlight, you wanna make sure that you have all the different wavelengths because the sunlight is every wavelength of energy, which corresponds to every color. So in our operatories, if you don't have color corrected lights, your photography eh, might be a little suspicious. There's ways around that, but you know, if you were to design an office, you have to make sure that you have color corrected lights in the, in the office, which most designers know, know that kind of thing. Uh, but what changes the light intensity? Maybe a light bulb goes out in the operatory, maybe the sunlight, coming in the ambient sunlight from the outside is different on a certain day when you're taking a photo even though you're inside the external influences of the intensity of the light is super important therefore when you take an image you really have to know was that image underexposed or overexposed it's it changes it literally changes patient within uh, different images of the same patient uh, it has to do with the angle you're coming in at whether you reflected the lips or not here we use Dioptrigate. Uh, white balance is important. So if you don't know that and you guys want to uh, chat about that moving on, I'm happy to do so. For those of you in the office, uh, Regan, I, I believe you know white balance. So you guys can hit up one of us uh, to go over that. But I would say this is a little, this is good, but maybe a little overexposed. This is underexposed. And there's a reason for that. I'll tell you in a second. This is definitely overexposed. Now, the reflection on the shade tab is not really the indicator of whether it's overexposed or not because the reflection has to do with the angle of the shade tab in relation to the flash. But the teeth are just, they're a little bright. It's kind of hard to see the character within the tooth. And that's what I use. If I can't see the character within the tooth, it's typically because I've put too much light energy in 
and not enough of it's coming back. Whereas this image here, I can see the character really well. So I use low light settings to tell me what the tooth looks like on the inside. It gives me an idea of the, the dentin, whereas the higher light intensities give me more of the enamel is how I think of it. I have no idea how accurate that is, but it is what it is. They have different purposes. I still like putting the shade tabs oriented this way, and here's why. If I'm shade matching the whole tooth, if it's a monochromatic tooth, which a lot of our patients are, I'll do incisal edge to incisal edge. But if I'm trying to match, trying to give the lab technician information up here, and I take this shade tab and I go incisal edge to incisal edge, this information and this information down here doesn't really line up. So this was my attempt at giving the lab technician some information on this hypocalcification area right here. So there are reasons why you want to have the shade tabs upright. Same image. That is underexposed. That's probably good, if not a little, little overexposed. Now, like we talked about in the beginning, I'm off here. I mean, I'm not paying attention to the occlusal plane. I should have been more upright or had the patient's chin come down. With photography, one of the best tricks is to have the patient move the patient, bring them up or down, have them move their head left or right. This sounds obvious, but anytime I, in the beginning when I did photography, I've also seen two rounds of master track where the new class comes in and Dr. Hempton is teaching photography. We all do it. <laughs> you know, we try to bend ourselves to get the right image. Not only is that ergonomically and sound, it's just, you're probably not going to get the best image. Anybody want to say whether this guy has a sleep problem or not? So again, I'm taking all kinds of photos. Here I brought out the Vita Classic. I wanted to get a little bit of influence with that shade tab. <laughs> different light settings. And then I also want to get some images without the shade tabs. I want to get a really up close and center uh, focus on just that tooth. Uh, this is tricky to do with cameras where you're this close, especially if you want to get an image of just the tooth. Um, that can be difficult. But look at the information the lab technician is going to have. This blue hue right here, that's not normal. I don't know why this guy has blue hue here. But you want to be able to tell that to the lab technician. If you told him 4M3, you're going to get back something that looks like the crown on the left. And here I start to turn down the light. And as I turn down the light, I get more character. This is very subtle. But you can see how the chroma in these areas is a lot more visible than there. I don't know, my eye can't pick up. I can see the white hypocalcification and I can see the, the crack right here, but I can't really pick up what's going on underneath. But when I do that, this center area is darker. It starts to die out right here, so on and so forth. Underexposed, good. So, so you're, you're just, just changing, changing like the shutter speed on this, right? right? Uh, You're keeping, keeping an aperture, aperture the, the same. same. Correct. So I am... How can I say this? I know how to use a dental camera. <laughs> I understand what those settings are, but with the dental camera... So we got our camera from Photomed. And Photomed has features on it that allow dentists to change the parameters very quickly. One of them is the plus minus, which is essentially... I would say the shutter speed, but I think it's a combination of them. But I, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to get to a point where I know exactly what's going on with, with the camera. I know what to do with the camera to get the information I need to do good dental photography. But if you want me to take a picture of a hummingbird and make sure his wings don't look like a ghost, I, I would have no, I mean, I know what shutter speed 
uh, I guess I know a little bit, but I don't know enough to answer your question. But most of the cameras that you buy for dental photography have settings that are made for this kind of photography. And on our camera, it's the plus minus button. We also have the U2 and U1 settings, which are the portrait and then the single two settings, so on and so forth. Laura might be able to give you an answer to that. She, she, knows, <laughs> she knows how to answer those questions. So what I do is I go through these photos. I have no idea when I take the photos which one's good and which one's bad. I select the ones that give me a good idea of the, of the shade of the tooth. It's important to know that your monitor should be somewhat decent. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get good representations. Uh, but to be honest, I haven't, I, I've done this for years on all kinds of different monitors. I haven't had much of an issue, but it might be something you want to keep in mind that if you're using an older monitor that does, doesn't have good color display, uh, you might be limited in your ability to, to actually do this. You can also use the camera, the back side of the camera, but that LED screen is a little, little bit smaller. We're already at 8 o'clock. Holy moly. All right. That was really fast. All right, let me end with this. Bisque bake. Uh, Mark, you were talking about when you deliver a crown, if it's off, you take the shade tab, take an image. Um, this is a socket shield case I did. Uh, I really wanted this to come out perfect. I want to publish this. There was a couple things I did with the, the surgery that I want the prosthetics to come out perfect. So I had the lab send me back the bisque bake. Uh, I don't know if that's taught in dental schools anymore. It's a super antiquated term. Basically, it's the ingot. So today, most things are being milled. It's what happens when the machine is done with it and before the lab technician starts layering on their porcelains. Have them send it to you, try it in, and then do a shade tab. Your lab technician will love you because they have the canvas, the color of the canvas, and then they have the porcelains that go on top in the patient's mouth. It's a really nice way to, to go about that. So bisque bake is a, another term for that. Bisque bake try-in. Uh, lastly, polarize. Absolutely love it. Uh, we have them in the office. It's a polarizing filter that goes on the front of the, the camera. It's customized for our camera lens. It removes all of the glare. You get something like this, and you can see things inside the teeth that you couldn't see before. Uh, polarize. Polar and then E-Y-E-S. All right. And lastly, the double cord technique for anterior aesthetic crowns. We went over this when we did the double cord technique, but it's important to revisit it. If you want to have a margin sitting underneath the gingival, a crown margin that sits underneath the gingival margin, you have to do something. Here's one way to do it. You pack your double zero cord, you prep your crown margin to the new displaced gingival margin after that first cord is done, then you pack your second cord and take your impression. When you deliver your crown, it will be subgingival. And this is obviously contingent upon healthy gum tissue. All right, any thoughts, questions while we have a minute or two left? Do you guys put micron contingency on some of those to help keep the tissue happy? Or do you use that trick before? We have a, a technique where we bring the patient in ahead of time. Are you talking about the, at the day of the appointment? I usually like, like um, um, if, if you, you catch them in hygiene, hygiene you paint them on, or like, like, you have a temporary where you know the tissue's not going to like it too much. much. Yep. Yeah, we started using two uh, percent chlorhexidine, yep, yep. which works great. You know, microprime G, glutaraldehyde is also an antibacterial agent, so it's doing the same thing. But we found if you do it like two or three days ahead of time, the tissue is amazing. Oh, sorry, so not microprime. I'm not Servitec, which is not familiar with that. It's, it's a, a chlorhexidine barbage. Okay, yes, same idea. Do you know the percentage? Um, I do I not, not, but like if, if we have a kid who's got, got really, really big red angry gums, gums or we're doing a class five, we'll paint that out a couple of days before. It's called Cer Servitec? Servitec Plus. I like it if it's a, it sounds like a gel or a varnish, so it has stickability to it. Yep, yep. yep. I'll, I'll do, do that, that on like a temporary, temporary for an anterior tooth that's something that's like that. Like that. Makes it just come back. Tissue should help your less bleeding. Yeah, good stuff. 
Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, yep. Check it out. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Have, have a good night. night. Later. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah.